Great. Uh, I was looking forward to the music. It's a great pleasure. Uh, my name is Louis Philippe, and thank you for introducing. Uh, as you probably realize, way too long for the American Standard Art, so it became LP. Uh, I'm leading a lab at, uh, at uh, CMU on multimodal computation. Uh, this is a group where we're interested how people communicate, uh, how we can also use this technology for healthcare, but the core of it, and really what I'm going to talk about today, is multimodal AI. You've heard about it in two other uh, talks in a different uh, perspective. I will try to bring them together in a framework that we uh, are teaching in the multimodal machine learning course at CMU, also uh, highlighting some of our research. So this is multimodal AI. Uh, and. It's exciting to see all these applications going on. Uh, we see it in uh, Assistant and also really soon in Cars, as we heard uh, from the talk for Uber. Uh, but personally, when I think of multimodal, I think of the three V of communication, verbal, vocal, and visual. What you say, how you say it, and the gesture and nonverbal that goes with it. This is what I believe uh, is core of human communication. And if you ask me, why do I care about multimodal AI? It's about its possible application on mental health. There's one person, uh, one in four people, adults, will experience at some point in their life mental health uh, illnesses. This is becoming so large, it is in fact number one uh, disability worldwide. We have 420 uh, million uh, people right now having mental health issues. How can we build technologies that can help the doctors in their assessment of mental health? Uh, this is one of the questions I would love to use multimodal AI to help answer that question. And so one example, a use case, is where the doctor is interacting with the patient, or we're in 21st century, it could be a virtual interviewer. I said virtual interviewer, not virtual doctor. I don't think we want to build technology that makes the decision, but we want to build decision support tools for the doctors. What the idea is, as the patient is interacting with the doctor, we are picking up on those behavioral markers that can help the doctor make a better assessment of mental health. Over the last 10 years of research in this area in our group, in my group, uh, we've studied psychosis, depression, and also very hard topic, but very important, is uh, suicidal ideations. I want to give you one example. I don't have time to talk about all of this work, but one example, which is specifically for psychosis and schizophrenia. Uh, in this case, one and very core aspect of schizophrenia is the language of the patients. And when they speak, they may have grammatically correct or almost correct sentences, but the ideas change. They go from ideas to idea. That's one of the possible symptoms that you will see. And so you want to be able to study these and try to identify objectively markers uh, in their speech. And this fluency is one aspect. There is, for people who've not studied this fluency before, uh, there's at least three types of this fluency. An edit, where you are saying something, maybe a pause filler, and then continuing. Uh, you have a repeat, I don't, is, I don't know what I exactly, and then finally a restart, where the pause filler will come in, and then a new sentence will start after that. So there's a complete rephrasing. And what we want to do is study these and specifically looking at negative uh, symptoms such as difficulty of abstract thinking, apathy, or even social withdrawal. 
In this study with uh, McLean, which is an initial study with 43 patients, uh, initial study, it was very interesting to see how computers were able to pick up on cues, specifically to identify two of them, edit and restart. Edit in the sense of uh, uh, probably with the withdrawal, social withdrawal, the hesitation, but restart was particularly interesting because of this idea of changing and rephrasing often or uh, uh, moving from topics to topics. Uh, psychosis has a different type of symptoms, which are often grouped in positive symptoms, like hyperactivity, hallucination, delusion, or hostility. And then it's interesting to look at what are their choices of words uh, for these patients, and specifically looking at two categories, power, uh, like example of superiority, important, exploit, or perceptual, looking at feeling, see. And it is, uh, uh, both categories uh, of these were very uh, well correlated in that same initial study with positive psychosis uh, uh, symptoms. This is an example. We, over the last 10 uh, years, developed a dictionary, more than 25 of these behavior markers. And the question is, how do you bring them together? How do you take all of this information and be able to merge this information? And that's where multimodal AI comes in. And one example of bringing this together is uh, early work where we looked at distress. And you wanted to predict what you see in blue are 100 patients ordered by the level of distress. And you can see in green their uh, prediction from the assessment tool. You don't want to over, you don't want to predict someone's distress when they're not, and you don't want to miss either, so you have these false positive, false negative as well. This is early work, this is for screening. If you ask me where this technology will be used in the future, in the early future, in the near future, it's probably in treatment, where you look at the person over time and can see their change over time. So this is now the main part of my talk, is how do we build multimodal AI that bring language, the three V, verbal, vocal, and visual together. And so if you have problem falling asleep tonight, I have a great paper for you, a survey paper on multimodal machine learning, wonderful way of falling asleep tonight after all these talks. And it identifies five main challenges in multimodal machine learning. The first two, and we had a great example in the talk previously, is translation, multimodal translation, and then in separate view of that is fusion, translating from one modality to another, or fusion, bringing modalities together. And to give a little bit of a different flavor of translation, because you know quite a bit probably about image captioning and VQAs, it's also to think of other ways of translating modality. How do you go from, uh, and we're in California, and I spent seven years of my life in LA, so I love the movie industry. How can I take a story narrative and automatically create a movie animation? And these animation takes a lot of time for animators to create. So how can we have computers maybe help with this? As a small stepping stone in that direction, very small stepping stone in that direction, how can we go from a narrative, uh, action-based narrative, a person walks in a circle, and be able to animate a virtual character with this? So at the core of it, how do we bring the two modalities together? Motion and language together. And we want to learn that joint space where an action like walking or waving, they're close to each other. And so that's where the space, how do you learn the space so that you can generate, given a specific input, you can generate the action of the character. And as a first stepping stone to do that is the uh, better, uh, the, the more obvious way is let's learn uh, uh, an encoder decoder. But we're not going to do it in a machine translation or the language. We're going to do it in a motion, input motion, output motion. But if you do this just by itself, it may learn a space with some holes, or it may not necessarily bring together all what is semantically relevant close to each other. And so that's why you want to learn it jointly, where the language is, like we could almost see from a computer vision perspective, is almost a regularizing, bringing together where a walking and running should be closer to each other than maybe a hand waving, for example. 
And so that's an example that you can do. And once you learn that, then you can start generating. So a person jog a few steps, or if you go more complex, a person step forward, turns around, and steps forward again. And this one is a kneeling person raise their arms onto the sides and stand up. As you can see, you can start bringing that uh, more and more complex of these. And I will say, and this is true for almost all generation, and you know very well in machine translation and dialogue, generation, you need to evaluate, and one of the key is also evaluating with human. And so we uh, evaluated with human performance, and one thing is to compare with the previous work, but also is to compare uh, what people believe is the closest. So it is interesting that this approach, the joint learning approach, is important. You need to learn it together, but it's still not ground true, so there's a lot more work to be done, but it's a good step in that direction. Uh, this is translating from language to motion, but it also we want to translate uh, from speech to gesture. It's a little bit like imagining a uh, virtual character or virtual robot like Sim Hi, Sensei. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And Sim, uh, uh, Ellie, in this case, Sim Sensei, a lot of these early uh, systems were a rule-based system. And as we want to get them more and more solo, pick up and more solalities, we want to be able to take advantage of data-driven approaches. Uh, early work were there uh, to pick up on this using a mix of graphical models and neural network. But if you ask me, uh, should you learn the general way uh, people are behaving? Or should you learn very specific? And what do I mean by specific is what we call nonverbal signatures. And the best example for that, and please don't fall asleep, but if you close your eyes, you can imagine what LP right now is going to do. You can imagine his behavior. You've seen me long enough. And so you learn a model. Now you can turn on your, uh, you can open your eyes, unless you were falling asleep. But yeah, uh, this is a, an example of nonverbal signature. And you want to learn specific to a person how they behave, but also you want to see how they behave with different kind of people. So it's not just speech and gesture translation. It's a it's a social translation. It's an interpersonal translation that you want also performing. And so you want to be able to have a model that can learn how to go from monadic, one person, to a dyadic, which is the interpersonal. And it has an example of this animation. This was work in collaboration with Facebook. Listen to the news, like a lot of people get shot in the keys for, like, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like, I think it's heavily gang yeah. place, like, so my high school, it was like, uh, there was like a few, like, like, different, like. So it's an early version. You can see that he was not so excited about it. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Uh, but yeah, the interpersonal gives you a lot. How many of you currently checking your cell phone or falling asleep also gives me a feedback on how well or how should I adjust my behaviors. So the multimodal also comes and the interpersonal. So it's multimodal translation and interpersonal translation. And I think that's one aspect also uh, that to look at. And that's why when you think of dialogue, this kind of bringing dialogue and multimodal together in these two. And it is from a, a training or from a performance perspective, it is important you cannot just look at interpersonal, which means it's very hard if I only look at one person to predict the other person. But it is still a, an important cue, but it's not the only cue. So interpersonal by itself is not sufficient. Intrapersonal, my voice and my gesture are a good cue, but you need both of them together. That's an example of translation. I wanted to give you other examples of translation because you've probably seen a lot of these image captioning. But this is translation. There's another challenge, which is fusion. Fusion is bringing modalities and learning complementarity between these modalities so that it can predict something new. So you're gonna, it will take verbal, vocal, and visual maybe to be able to predict something like, for example, uh, emotion. 
So you bring these modalities together to be able to predict sentiment or emotion. You're bringing and predicting something new. And so if you are excited about this or if you are just curious about this field uh, uh, where you're looking not just at translating but also at fusion, there's an example of this, the CMU Mose data set. It's a good Kickstarter. It's a good place to start. There's some others, but that's a good place to start. 23,000, that's usually a number that's large enough for a lot of our neural architecture. Let me give you two paradigms of fusion, just so that you have an idea when I talk about fusion, what are the kind of paradigms that you can explore. The first one is memory-oriented paradigm for fusion. And the idea here is I've been talking, I don't know, maybe 15, 10, 15 minutes. What is important of what I said up to now? You probably have a very succinct summary of what I talked about. And how did you build that? One possible way, is that every time you, as I li you listen, you're like, okay, there, he said something that looked interesting, there's a good evidence there, let me add it to my memory. And as, as you go along, you add your evidence and then you merge them together in your memory. That's possibly one way to computationally uh, operationalize this, and that's what the memory fusion will do, is as you listen to a video, you will do local fusion, and those local fusion will identify important evidence. But that's not important evidence in only one modality. It's important evidence in all three or four or five modalities that you have. Bring these together and then bring that into the memory and accumulating. That's one paradigm of multimodal fusion. The other one, because when I say recurrent, you're right away thinking sequence or temporal. But you can also use another, so that's, that's temporal recurrence, recurrence, but you can also use it for fusion. So you will do a kind of a fusion approach, which is uh, um, uh, where you split your fusion in small steps. So for example, if I go and I try to evaluate a sentence, his average presenter when, okay? And then, and then you will, uh, as you do your fusion temporally, that's always happening, you will start to do your fusion also in multiple stage. So average. Average is may probably more of a neutral word by itself, but if I'm frowning at the same time, there's probably something about being negative uh, at that point. So it's a kind of a weekly negative. This is one, but then I will have the algorithm try to look for other interesting cues and highlight them, like the fact that I have a very loud voice. And so you have the loud voice to this. The loud voice by itself is an emphasis. That's something that I emphasize. Now, if I look at it in a recurrence fusion, I add the negative to the emphasis, then it becomes more of a stronger negative. Now I can look at other cues in my, in my, in my current uh, time step and look at a shrug or an elongation, and maybe this one brings some ambivalence, and then I, if I do it, add the strong negative with the ambivalence, then I get an emotional state that's even more complex. So you go kind of simple to go to harder. That's another way of thinking of fusion. I'm just giving two examples of fusion. There's a lot more that are being built over the last few years, but that's just to give you. So you have translation and fusion. Translation and fusion as two of the main core. Then there's definitely representation and alignment. Representation is definitely a topic you've heard about, and I will give you some what makes it interesting in the multimodal world. But if you ask me what's quite unique or very uh, a few other places uh, other that, or you have is, is alignment. How do you work with synchrony or asynchrony between modalities? That is a very interesting aspect. And as you can imagine, there is an interesting parallel between multimodal and also other application like dialogue or machine translation where alignment, co-reference, and other things like this will be important. So let me start with representation. And let me give you an example uh, to exemplify the complexity of multimodal uh, representation. And to do that, we'll keep the sentiment as my goal, sentiment prediction, and we'll look at it from a unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal. At the unimodal level, if I'm in the US and I say this movie is sick, uh, this is 
probably positive, although it may be negative, but it's it most likely positive, but it's, it's unknown. But if I say this movie is fair, it's probably positive or neutral. If I'm smiling, it's probably a cue related to positive. If I'm loud, loud could be positive or negative, and so this is still an ambiguous case. So this is unimodal. Now you would like to have bimodal. This movie is sick and I smile. It's more likely to be positive. This movie is sick and I frown, most likely negative. This movie is sick and I'm loud, eh, could be still positive or negative. Now, trimodal interaction. This movie is sick, I smile and it's loud, probably very positive. And I must say, my life would have been very easy if it, I just stopped there. But sometimes, there is non-linearity in your representation. And the example is here. This movie is fair. Even if I smile, even if I have a loud voice, there's fireworks in the background, that doesn't change anything. Language takes over, takes over, and then it becomes a non-linearity in my representation. So you need to be able to handle those non-linearity. A nice, simple, but powerful way is to build tensors to do this representation. By doing a small trick of adding a little one to your representation of language and visual, you can learn a tensor, you can represent your uh, multimodal in a tensor where both unimodal and bimodal will be both represented in a tensor. And then with three modalities, then it becomes a, a, tri a 3D tensor where you have both both the unimodal, the bimodal, and the trimodal together. As you can expect, the number of parameters may increase with the number of modality, and that's why there was some follow-up work using some kind of decomposition uh, approach to allow you to scale uh, almost linearly with the number of, um, of modalities. So that's an example. Uh, another example um, that is a factorized representation. That is another example of a multimodal representation where you're not trying to just learn one joint representation, but you're learning multiple factors into this, and some of them may be unimodal, some of them bimodal, and some of them trimodal. But I don't want to just do representation. I want to also do representation and alignment. I want to align modalities together. And I will not be able to give a talk in an LP conference if I didn't say the word transformer. Uh, so, Yes, multimodal transformer is one way of approaching this. What I like about this is that it enables us to handle a lot of the natural asynchrony that happen in multimodal signals. And so multimodal, the transformer by itself brings that in our little extension, but uh, interesting extension of that brings it for the multimodal case. And we will bring it not in the obvious case, which will be just to concatenate modalities and train a transformer on top of it, we will look at it in a more cross-modal way. The idea of cross-modal is to be able to handle asynchrony. In the perfect world, every word will be correctly aligned with the visual behavior that goes with it. But in the real world, there's a lot of alignment, misalignment between modalities. A word can have a relationship with a, a frame, a video frame, much earlier. So for this, we want to learn this uh, transformer in a cross-modal way. We want to learn what is the representation, verbal representation, that is visually contextualized. We want to use the visual information to learn a better language representation. A word representation with spectacle, you want to be able to find from the current visual information where are my similarities. Use that similarity information to now learn a representation that at this point becomes a correlated visual information. What is it in the visual information that's useful or seem to be correlated? And then the magic trick is to use a residual connection that will say, what is it that I can add to the current representation, verbal representation, that brings this new visually contextualized representation of language? As you expect, I will not just do it from vision to uh, uh, verbal, I will do all possible pair. How does visual help language? How language can help vision? And I will do it. 
And uh, as you can probably also expect, it will be in a hierarchical multiple layer way. And so that I finally, at the end of the day, get my multimodal representation. So this is the multimodal transformer representation. And what's really interesting is that it performs very well on without pre-alignment. Uh, and here, the late fusion, uh, if you ask, uh, I think there was a question about, uh, for Mary about late fusion. Late fusion is perfect when you have a lot of misalignment. Uh, late fusion will handle that because it, it does all of this work in one case. Uh, but what's great is here you can handle this misalignment and build a, a representation that handle that misalignment and still take advantage of the cross-modal information. The late fusion, by default, doesn't handle the cross-modal interaction until much later at the later stage. And what's interesting is the multimodal transformer also works uh, even with Align uh, data, so that was really nice. If you love uh, transformers, uh, and it's probably hard to not love them right now, um, there's, uh, I think, a lot of interesting future work in trying to understand why they work, what makes them work, and we did a little step in that direction with the work on looking at how kernels could be one way to explain uh, transformers, and that's one direction. The last piece, the last challenge that I want to talk about is now we have representation, alignment, translation, and fusion. Also, there is the aspect of co-learning. Co-learning is really interesting, is that I have a problem. It is in one modality only. I have, let's say, language only problem. But I will use other modality to help me in that unimodal problem. For one example, I would like to be able to have better representation of spoken language. Spoken language often naturally comes with the other modalities. But I may have only the transcript of spoken language, but I would still like to use multimodal information during training so that at test time, I can use only language. Uh, and so an example for that is learning by translation. So you will learn a representation from today was a great day. And it, it, you know because of, of, uh, of uh, pair data that this data happened during training, also during this video sequence. And so given this, you can uh, learn a, a sequence to sequence. But the important thing, as you probably know, you also need the cyclic loss to be able to keep the information. And then, yeah, this is training. You train the multimodal way through translation. Now, the cool part is that test time, the vision disappears, and you only have language. But the language was learned using audio and visual information. Now, if you have infinite amount of data, this may be not the approach for you. But if you have a limited resources uh, for your case, this may be a place where multimodal could help you. And that was really interesting, because then you can use that language only at test time to be able to predict something like sentiment. And here's what was really exciting. We compare with almost most of the state of the art until that point, and all of them use training and testing using multimodal information for training and testing. This other approach uses it only for training, not for testing. And then it was able to perform as good or somewhat better in some case. So this is a summary of the five challenges in uh, multimodal machine learning. This is an early draft. This is, in fact, based on five years of teaching a course on multimodal machine learning, trying to gather what are the challenges. This is a working progress, and we uh, welcome your feedback. We build over the years a taxonomy of these challenges. And if you're like me, and you're like, OK, what is the next big thing? The next big thing, it takes together this third uh, challenge that I talk uh, in my group about, which is human communication dynamic. How do I get computer to understand social intelligence? And that is, if you ask me what I'm excited about, this is one of the direction with mental health. Uh, this is the other aspect, which is how do we build computers able to understand common sense and social intelligence reasoning? And so this is why we built this data set. And it has to go beyond, like, is this person happy or sad? I, 
it's interesting, but I don't want, I want very subtle, very complex social behavior. Uh, are people getting along? Uh, I, what is the atmosphere in the room right now? Uh, and then go even further, you or could go a little bit slimmer. What, was the man hurt? What is the man who was hurt insulted? Uh, and was the woman brave? There's a lot of these interesting uh, challenges. This is a data set for the future. I, 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 the last time probably someone said that, uh, then they had the paper sub solving it next week. But hopefully one of you will solve it and we can move together in uh, bringing together social interaction, multimodal AI and healthcare and mental health. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for a couple questions, one or two. Um, okay, I'll, I'll ask mine then, um, as usual. <laughs> so I was curious about the, the, the first part where you're talking about the, the social, the, sorry, the, the mental health. And I'm wondering, how does it translate to other cultures and other languages that work? Have you done any work on that? Yeah, um, we still have to uh, confirm these intuitions. But some behavior markers, I believe, will, uh, will generalize. For example, for depression, there's one of the symptoms that's called psychomotor retardation. You're moving a little bit less. It turns out you can see it through your gesture, but also to how you pronounce uh, different vowels. Uh, so the vowels, A, E, E, O, U, they will all be a little bit closer. They're the French one. I never had to pronounce the English vowels, but yeah. And they will all be a little bit closer to each other. So so reduction in the vowel space may be something that will be generalizable at least through some of the Latin uh, languages, although other languages will have a slightly different space. But there's some behaviors that will change. Some others, like eye gaze, will probably change between, modality, uh, between cultures, yeah. Hey, LP. I have a simple question. So you're talking about multimodal fusion. So every modality really comes information with uh, totally different features. So right now, most of us are just trying to lump them together in hidden space. So is there a way that we can inject certain uh, intuition from human or other, thing, uh, other expert knowledge in the fusion so have, have it a more in a structure inside of the fusion? I, I love that. Uh, I, think, I think this is the next, uh, next version to that. Uh, it comes a different, uh, different approach to that. One is, um, do you really want to learn a joint space where everything will learn, will, do you learn will live together? I'm not always sure this is necessary. What it is, I believe more in factorized representation. Factorized representation also help because they may bring some of these intermediate representation that is more intuitive. Uh, and that will also probably hopefully help you if you have external knowledge to help. How do you define those different factors? Uh, jointly bringing everything will bring a little bit of a challenge. So I think when we talk about coordinated representation uh, where, or factorized representation, I think this is one direction where we can more easily bring extra knowledge. There's probably a lot more work to be done, but that's one that comes to mind. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much once again. Oh, there is one. We, one question. I think Quick question. Okay, yes. So uh, thank quick. you for your amazing... Uh, uh, presentation. So, um, you, you mentioned about uh, this um, conversational AI engines, which you can collect collect information for uh, mental health and also detecting different situations. But how far you see uh, we are from having uh, conversations that can be like goal oriented with the purpose of making someone feel uh, happier or something like that, and, and also can contain emotions in the conversation themselves. Yes, I, I think this is a very long-term project, what you're describing. Uh, in our case, we, I, call, I call the virtual human a virtual interviewer on purpose because the person is there to gather information. And it's a much easier problem 
People love talking about themselves. If you ask them questions, they will pick up and start talking uh, if they are able to feel rapport. And that's, I think, an aspect of, of maybe you were hinting at. It's not just creating one that creates emotion just for the fun of it. You want to create one that creates rapport, that creates a feeling of connections. I think this is one direction I'm, I'm interested in uh, and for that. But in our case, because we were doing interviews, we had our job a little bit easier uh, in the sense that we are gathering information. And so we, uh, the conversation is a lot more, I will say, uh, human-centric in that case and the person telling. Uh, but I think the hard part was really how do we build a virtual character that brings this feeling of rapport? And I think there's more research to be done there, uh, but there's, at, at least it was a good first uh, attempt there. Yes. Thank you. Ray? Thank you very much once again. Oh, I, I, yeah, thank you very much.